Amen. Aren't you glad the Lord brought Jared and his family to us? So, yeah. This is a special day for, uh, for Jared and for his family, but also a special day for our church as we have an opportunity to ordain someone to the gospel ministry. So we don't get to do this very often. We've done it quite a few times over the years, but uh, uh, it's kind of a, a rare occasion, actually, when we get a chance to do this. And so I thought today would be a great opportunity to uh, share with you from God's Word exactly what it means to ordain a man to the ministry. Uh, perhaps you've got some questions about that, or you've been curious about some of the traditions that we have when we do that. So uh, that's what I would like to do this morning. So uh, ordination of, is something that uh, certainly is taught in the scriptures uh, throughout uh, the ages, the last 2,000 years. You know, we've come up with different traditions and uh, ceremony and uh, certificate, things like that, that we give. Uh, Probably uh, not exactly what was done in the early days of the church, but certainly nothing wrong with what we do and how we do it. When a man is ordained as a minister, he's ordained by God himself. And so what we do is simply recognize that and have an opportunity to, to have a special service where we, uh, we demonstrate our love for the individual and the fact that God uh, has placed it on our hearts to recognize the fact that God has already ordained him to the ministry. So... It's something that God does and not man, but uh, something that we recognize and something that we participate in through a special time of, of service that we have today. Uh, in Acts chapter 14, we have an example of the ordination of ministers. Now, this is when Paul and Barnabas were on a missionary trip and were passing through the area of Asia Minor, uh, establishing churches and uh, ordaining men. In verse 23, it says, When they had appointed elders in every church... And prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. And so we have an example here of, of uh, men being set apart as, as elders. I'll be talking a little bit about elders and pastors and, and bishops and all that. And what does that mean? But uh, they ordained these men. They set them apart and commissioned them to be leaders in the various churches that were established. Of course, that was the beginning, really, of the spread of the gospel through the known world at that time. And God used that in a tremendous way, and even up to this very day, where we continue to ordain men to the gospel ministry. There are actually two offices that uh, require ordination in the Bible. The first one is a minister of the word, a minister of the word. And that would apply certainly to Jared this morning. Uh, this would have to do with a pastor of a church, a senior pastor, or even a staff member, as Jared is, someone who has responsibility over a ministry of some kind in the church. So it could apply to, to, to being a worship pastor, a worship leader, uh, youth leader, education, all kinds of various staff members that we have today that they didn't actually have in the early days of the church, but certainly these guys are, are pastors and leaders in their various areas. Also, evangelists are ordained and set apart to serve as uh, servants of the Lord as they go out and share their gift of preaching and trying to win people to faith in Jesus Christ. Chaplains are ordained and set apart for their specific ministry and, and reaching out to different groups like in the military, hospitals, and things like that. So this is uh, one of the offices where we ordain someone. We set someone apart for special service, uh, the area of being a minister of the Word. And whether you're, you're actually preaching from the Word of God, or you're leading people in worship as Jared does, or you're, you're ministering to folks as a leader in the church, as a pastor, then certainly that's someone who would be ordained and set apart for that special service. So a minister of the Word. The other office of ordination, of course, is the deacon. Deacons are, are set apart by the church and called by the church. Uh, Acts chapter 6 really is the best example I think we have of men who most likely were deacons. So the word deacon isn't used there. But they were men who were set apart because of their, their love for the Lord, the fact that they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and they were set apart for special service, a special need within the church. The word deacon in the Greek is diakonos, and that really tells us the role of the deacon. Uh, it means to be a servant. A deacon is an official servant in the church who is set apart by the church to have a special role of serving and ministering 
to the body. And so we have these two offices where ordination takes place. And so throughout the years, we've ordained many deacons in our church and some ministers in our church, and many of which have gone off out into the world to serve the Lord in other places. But these are the two offices of ordination. Now you may be wondering, as I have often wondered, why do we, why do we have someone licensed and why do we have someone ordained? What's the difference anyway? Well, when a person, an individual, gives evidence that God has called him into the ministry, spiritual gifts have become very, very evident in that person's life, and that person feels as though the Lord has called them into special service, that's when we generally license that person to the gospel ministry. And so this was done for Jared when he first came to us, and he was licensed by the church. That simply requires a vote of the church membership, a majority vote, to recognize that he has spiritual gifts and to recognize that he has a calling from the Lord upon his life. And so we set someone apart in that way by licensing them to the ministry. Uh, really, it's just a way of recognizing their spiritual gifts and encouraging them in their decision to follow the call of the Lord. And so it doesn't require near as much scrutiny or, uh, or activity, I guess you would say, as an ordination, but it's kind of a first step towards ordination where we affirm someone and we edify someone and we encourage someone because we recognize that that person has uh, the Holy Spirit uh, moving in their life and ha has gifted them in such a way that they can use their spiritual gifts in the ministry. And so that's what it means to license someone. The only thing it does legally is really uh, authorize someone to do a wedding legally in our country. And so, you know, that's really all that it does. And, and someone who has been licensed by a church is uh, authorized to do weddings. And so that's just one of the, the legal ramifications of being licensed to the ministry. Now, what's the difference in being licensed and being ordained? One who begins vocational service as a minister is ordained by the church. That's when someone says, okay, now I'm, I'm going to use my spiritual gifts in a vocational way. I'm going to use them in the church. Even if they're not paid, uh, they would still be using that gift within the church and the church recognizes that this person has entered into the ministry. And so that's when we have an ordination service. It, it requires a whole lot more scrutiny and um, really it requires much more detail than the licensing of a minister. One thing that it requires is, to, is the forming of an ordaining council. And so four weeks ago, uh, I asked some pastor friends and, and uh, also Aaron, who's a member of our church and on staff, asked these guys who had been ordained as ministers uh, to sit in and to have a time of, of evaluation of Jared. And Jared looked forward to that with great enthusiasm, that we were going to, to question him. And, uh, you know, it's a very serious matter, but we often kind of make light of it and joke about it, you know, and, and tell the person we're going to put a, a red light on them, you know, and we're going to turn all the lights off and we're going to turn up the heat, you know, and ask a bunch of questions. But it's very, very serious. And I really appreciate the men who participated in this because every single one of them took it very, very seriously. They've all been there and they understand exactly what this entails. And so you form an ordaining council for a minister of ordained men who have already been ordained to the ministry. And these men have the assignment on behalf of our church, because I requested that they do this, to evaluate Jared's call to the ministry, to evaluate his spiritual life, the fact that he's truly been born again, that God has called him and is going to use him as a ministry. And we also question him about his theological beliefs, make sure that he is sound biblically, that he really does know the scriptures and believes in the scriptures and the word of God. And so this is a very serious matter, you know, and, and the Bible really, I think, instructs us that we need to be very, very serious when we come to a point where we're going to ordain someone as a minister in the, in the work of the Lord. And so that took place about four weeks ago. In fact, on May the 8th is when the, the council met and had this time of evaluation of Jared. Now, there are some examples in the scriptures of ordination. Uh, some of which come from the Old Testament. One of them that comes to mind is when Jacob really kind of ordained Ephraim and Manasseh. If you remember that in, in Genesis chapter 48, Jacob, uh, very advanced in age by this time, uh, had his two grandsons stand before him, and he placed his hands on their heads. We'll, we'll see this a lot, the laying on of hands, placing the hands on someone. In fact, he crossed his hands, if you remember, 
and, and he put his right hand on the youngest, Ephraim, instead of Manasseh. In fact, uh, you know, uh, Joseph was concerned about that. said, no, dad, dad. He thought his dad was, you know, getting a little old and, and confused and, and was doing it wrong. And, and Jacob knew exactly what he was doing because he knew that Ephraim was going to rise above his brother in his walk with the Lord. And uh, he told his, his son that. He said, no, I, I understand how you feel, but this is what the Lord has led me to do. So this is a very spiritual matter. And uh, Jacob placed his hands on his grandsons and actually bestowed a blessing upon them and gave a prophecy about their future and how they would serve the Lord and all that they would do. And, and so this is a, an example of, of commissioning or ordination or specifically a blessing someone that has a very, very spiritual connotation. It comes from the Lord. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Numbers chapter 8, we're told that the Israelites selected some men, the Levites, and set them apart as they were instructed. And the Israelites placed their hands on the Levites to ordain them as priests in the Lord's service. At that time, uh, they had the tabernacle in the wilderness where they were wandering around. Eventually, of course, they would have the temple when Solomon built the temple. But the Levites had the responsibility of serving as priests on behalf of the people and, and ministering to people through their, their activities in the, in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And so the Israelites were told, place their hands on the Levites and commission them or ordain them to this special service for the Lord. Another example is when Moses commissioned Joshua. Numbers chapter 27 if you recall, Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land because of his, his disobedience to the Lord. And so he would die there on the eastern side of the, the Jordan River and uh, would not be allowed to go in. And the Lord instructed him to take his, uh, his, men, his, his uh, understudy, I guess you would say, uh, Joshua, and to, to place his hands on him and to commission him as the new leader of the Israelites. Because Moses, of course, is going to die, and the Lord himself is going to bury him. Uh, before he died, he got to go up on Mount Nebo and to, to see the promised land and to see all of these things that God had brought to pass, but he himself was not allowed to go in. And so he ordained or commissioned Joshua to be the next leader of God's people. And so very much an ordination service, a commissioning of someone for a very, very important purpose. We've already seen in Acts 14 how Paul and Barnabas ordained elders in the various churches. And I'll talk a little bit more about elders in just a moment. But, but uh, Paul and Barnabas went around and ordained these men and established these men and commissioned these men to serve the churches, to be leaders in the churches. And so they did that in all the various churches. If you don't have any kind of leadership, then things would fall apart very quickly. And so these men were established uh, by Paul and Barnabas as they were led by the Holy Spirit to ordain these men as pastors or elders or bishops in the various churches. And then as I mentioned in Acts chapter 6, you have the apostles and the church itself involved in ordaining those first deacons, those first official servants in the church. The apostles uh, instructed the, the church to call out men who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the church made that selection of these, these seven men. And then the apostles laid their hands on these men and ordained them or set them apart and commissioned them for the special service that they had in the church. And so this gives us a little bit of background about uh, ordination and, and, and why we do these things and what it entails, what it means. And you may say, well, what is, what is with the laying on of hands anyway? What does that mean? Very much a part of, of ordination. Uh, several things that uh, the laying on of hands symbolizes. First of all, I think it symbolizes a blessing from the Lord. That someone is being blessed of the Lord. Just as Jacob blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. It, it indicates a blessing that's coming from the Lord upon that person. And it is a tremendous blessing and joy for a man to be ordained, either as a minister of the word or as a deacon. It's a great honor to be chosen to be ordained. Uh, a minister recognizes God's call upon his life to serve as a minister. The church calls out the deacons to ordain them. And, and in either case, and in both cases, it's a great, great honor and a great responsibility to serve in these positions. And so you can understand why this is very, very meaningful and important to Jared this morning. 
for a body of believers to come together and to say, we recognize that God has his hand upon you, that God has gifted you, that God has called you into the ministry. We recognize that and we affirm that decision of the Lord and we want to have a special time to, to recognize you and to set you apart in a very official and special way before the Lord as a minister. And so that's a very powerful thing in a minister's life. I, know, I understand exactly how Jared feels this morning. He sees so many of you that have been such a, a, an instrumental part of his life here this morning to, to celebrate this with him and to rejoice in what God has done in his life. And I know he's come a long way since he came to know the Lord as his Savior. All of us have, right? Our lives are changed and impacted and, and affected in such a powerful way. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's something that the Lord takes great pleasure in. And so it's a wonderful privilege to participate in an ordination service. It's a wonderful blessing for the man who is being ordained. And so this is a tremendous blessing for Jared this morning to be, to be recognized and to be blessed in this way. Laying on of hands also uh, symbolizes setting apart for service. Setting on someone apart for service. Uh, just as Moses laid his hands on Joshua, set him apart for service, and commissioned him to go forth and to be the leader of the Israelites. Uh, imagine Joshua having to fill the sandals of Moses. It's a pretty big, uh, pretty big responsibility, isn't it? And so this is an amazing thing. And Joshua had been a very, very, very faithful servant of the Lord, and God chose him to be the one who would lead the Israelites after Moses died. And so Moses here is setting him apart for service and just placing his hands upon him not only symbolizes a blessing upon this man, but also the fact that he has been chosen and set apart for this very, very important responsibility. And so that's why we do that during the service to have the ordained men that are present to come by, those who would like to, and to, to place their hands on the candidate, on Jared, and to offer a prayer and to whisper a prayer to him, to ask God's blessing upon his ministry and, and upon this very, very special occasion. So that's one reason why we lay our hands on someone who is ordained. And then the, the third reason, I think, is that it symbolizes the gifting of the Holy Spirit, that God's Holy Spirit has... has blessed this man and gifted this man for the specific purpose of ministry and serving other believers and also those outside the church. And so certainly Jared has a gift that's been given to him by the Lord. You know, it's interesting in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul mentions to Timothy uh, his ordination, Timothy's ordination. And he says, you recall when you were ordained by the elders of the church and they placed their hands on you. And he talked about his gift actually being received when they placed their hands on young Timothy. And so in the early days of the church, I think it was a little different than it is today. And they sometimes actually received that spiritual gift upon their the ordination when the hands were laid upon that person. And this was the Lord's way of demonstrating to others how, how God was so much involved in this and was gifting this person for the work of the ministry. Uh, folks may argue, I guess, as to what point a person receives a gift from the Lord. I believe upon your salvation, the Lord gifts you and gives you those spiritual gifts. Some people have many, some people just have one, but every single believer has at least one spiritual gift that has been given to them that the Lord wants them to use in the ministry. Now, a spiritual gift is much deeper than just an ability. Uh, you know, Jared has a tremendous ability to, to play music and to sing, but a lot of other people have an ability that are not even believers. It goes way beyond just an ability. Yes, an ability is involved, but it is a special spiritual calling upon that person. And a person is gifted by the Holy Spirit to use that ability to bring great praise and glory and honor to the Lord and to bless other believers. And so a spiritual gift is much, much different than just an ability. It is an ability, but it's much stronger than that. And so certainly the Lord has, has gifted Jared uh, to serve our church and to serve him primarily as an ordained minister. Now, in 1 Timothy 5.22, Paul warned us not to be too hasty in the laying on of hands. What does that mean? That means this is a very serious matter. And you don't just ordain someone because they'd like to do that. Well, I think I'd like to do that. Could I be ordained? You know, it doesn't work that way. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Lord in a person's life. 
Uh, I heard of a church one time where the pastor said, well, who all would like to be a deacon? Raise your hand if you'd like to be a deacon. We're going to ordain you, every one of you, you know, and it doesn't work that way. This is something that is led by the Holy Spirit. This is a very serious matter, and certainly a very, very serious matter when it comes to a minister of the Word. That's why we form a council. That's why we have a time of evaluation. That's, where, that's why we pray about this and make sure this is exactly what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do because this is a big deal. It really is. It's a, it's a big, big deal in the church and also in the work of the kingdom. And so again, that's why it's so special to the man being ordained because uh, you know, this is the work of God in a man's life and the fact that other believers recognize that God has done something in this man's life and is going to use him as one of his servants. And so all of that gives you a little bit of background about, about ordination. Now, I just want to share a few quick verses here from 1 Timothy 3 about, uh, about the qualifications of a minister. Now, when it comes to, to service in the church, uh, the word minister can apply to various individuals, right? It can be the senior pastor, uh, the one who's in charge of the oversight of the entire church, which would, would fall to me. But it could also refer to a, a staff member, someone who has responsibility of oversight and leadership in a particular area of ministry. And so there are three titles that are used in the New Testament with regards to the, the minister in the church that really apply to the same individual. In that, that, fact, that word is used interchangeably in a couple of verses in the New Testament. One of them is the word bishop. Now, most Baptists don't use that word. Uh, would you all like to call me Bishop Randy? Well, might raise a few eyebrows, you know, but uh, uh, we think of uh, other brothers and sisters uh, using those terms, like in the Catholic Church or Episcopalian Church or something like that. But a bishop uh, comes from the word episkopos in the Greek. It simply means overseer, a supervisor, someone who oversees a ministry. And so the verses we're going to look at this morning in the NIV use the word overseer. That's the, that's the word bishop. It simply means someone who oversees a ministry. Jared has responsibility for overseeing the worship ministry of our church and working with a band and, and with the sound team and the video folks and the camera folks, everybody, all these folks that are involved in, in the area of, uh, of worship in our church. That's an awesome responsibility. And uh, working with any group of people can be challenging. We all know that because we have different personalities and temperaments and things like that. And I always admire worship leaders because uh, of the uh, awesome responsibility they have to work with folks that are gifted in the area of music and singing and things like that because these folks are very, very creative. And we all know about creative temperament, right? Creative people are just different. I wish I was more creative. I can't draw anything. I can sing a little bit. I'm not that good. I can't play anything. I took guitar lessons one time, but it didn't last because I got frustrated and quit, you know. I just didn't have that that ability really to get into that. And so I admire folks that have that, that responsibility. And I want to tell you something, it's, it's, a, it's a big job to work with people that play in a band and, and other creative people. It's a real challenge sometimes. And so uh, we need to pray for Jared as he does that, as we would any minister who serves in the church. The same thing should be said for the other areas of the church as well. And so this is his responsibility, you know, to work with those who lead us in worship primarily. And so we use the word bishop or overseer. Two other words, one of them is elder. Elder, I think, indicates the maturity of the individual. It doesn't have anything to do with age. He doesn't have to be an old man. So he's just 31. You know, he's still wet behind the ears, you know. So he's still a, he's a young guy. You don't have to be an old man, you know, to be an elder in a church. You can be a young man. Timothy was a young man. And yet he was an elder in his church. He, it indicates his spiritual maturity. Not physical age, but spiritual maturity. Certainly Jared has that. And so the term elder is used. Some churches have a, a multiple number of elders. Most Baptist churches just have one primary pastor and other staff members. Uh, but, you know, the Lord can use either system, I believe. And then the other term is pastor. That's the one Baptists have really taken to. The word pastor, poimen in the Greek, means to be a shepherd. I love that, don't you? To, to be a shepherd of God's people, to lead God's people as an under-shepherd under the chief shepherd, who of course is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so my responsibility is to shepherd the entire flock and, and to oversee the staff and all of that. But we have individual staff members who have responsibility to give leadership in their area of calling and ministry. And certainly they're pastors as well. They're shepherds who lead people and encourage people and work with people. And so we use the word pastor. Overseer, which is a bishop, elder, pastor, they all refer to the same office a minister of the word, someone who ministers in imparting the word. When we sing praise choruses and we sing hymns, aren't we, aren't we focused on the word of God? Many of the songs we have today come from right out of the scriptures. And so we're singing and we're expressing the word of God uh, before the Lord and to the Lord and to one another. And so certainly Jared is a, a minister of the Word, and he does teaching as well. He loves to teach and to, to talk to people about the Word of God and to instruct folks. And so certainly he has that calling as a, as a pastor in our church. Now, three things quickly about a, about a minister and his qualifications from 1 Timothy chapter 3. First, the, the minister's calling. In verse 1, Paul says, Here is a, a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer or a bishop, pastor and elder, he desires a noble task. Now, at first glance, when you read that, you might think, well, does that mean that anybody wants to do it can just do it? No. What does this mean? To me, this means that God clearly calls ministers and gives them a great desire to serve within their heart. God is the one who calls and ordains a man into the ministry. And then certainly the Lord is not going to call someone that he doesn't give that desire within his heart to serve and to do these things. Every man who's been ordained knows exactly what that means. Uh, I've shared you, with you many times my testimony about how I was very shy and an introvert, and very fearful of, of preaching, even the thought of it. And when the Lord began to deal with me about being a pastor, it scared the daylights out of me. And I thought I could never do that. I could never get up in front of people. But the Lord gave me a great desire to do that that overcame my fear and led me to understand that's exactly what he wanted me to do and that all things are possible through Christ. And the Lord en enabled me and empowered me to do the very thing that he was calling me to do. It used to worry me that I, I was fearful and I felt inadequate about serving as a pastor. I used to worry, well, there's just something wrong with me, you know, and that I don't have this great desire to do this. And, and then I realized that really that's a good thing. Same thing happened to Moses, right? He was, he was reluctant. In fact, the Lord delights in using folks that, that are somewhat apprehensive and fearful about serving because they feel so inadequate. That means that that person is usable in the hands of the Lord. They're not going to take credit for anything themselves. It's all to the glory of God that he would use that person. It pleases the Lord to use the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. And that's exactly what the Lord did in my life. And I think most ministers feel that way. It's a very humbling experience to be called into the ministry. And so God is the one who calls the minister and gives him that desire, that conviction to serve uh, in, in whatever capacity he calls him to serve. And then secondly, the, the minister's character. Look at verse 2. Paul says the overseer must be above reproach. And he gives a long list of things about the minister's life that have to do with his character. And so this speaks to a man's character and to his integrity, to his honesty. These are some things that should be very, very evident in any man who is entering into the ministry. And certainly I think Jared falls into that category, a man of great integrity and honesty and character before the Lord. Uh, he certainly is well suited to serve as an example to others of what it means to be a faithful Christian. And so this is, this is focused on when uh, Paul writes here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about what it means to be a minister. And then finally we have the minister's maturity. Verses 6 and 7. Paul says he must not be a recent convert, not a new Christian, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. The devil fell because of pride, right? He was prideful and conceited and puffed up. Thought he could actually rise above God. And so a minister must be someone who is very humble, someone who, who is very mature and is not one who is given to pride or arrogance. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. How many times have we seen ministers fall 
because of pride, because of arrogance, because they gave in to the temptation of the devil. The devil delights in bringing down a minister because it hinders the work of the Lord. And so the devil certainly never relents in trying to do that. And so these are some of the qualifications of being a, an ordained minister for the Lord. And that's what we're all about this morning. Having this time where we come and, and we set apart Jared as an ordained minister in the work of the Lord. And so wherever he goes from this time forth, he was ordained on this day in this church by this body of believers as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That's a glorious thing. Praise the Lord. So now we come to the point where we have the laying on of hands. And as I mentioned, we had an ordaining council that met four weeks ago and evaluated Jared. And during that process, we elect someone to serve as a, a clerk, someone who comes and gives a recommendation, an official recommendation to the church. And so Aaron was elected as our, uh, our clerk, and he's going to come and just really just recommend Jared, and then we're going to take a vote as to whether or not we'll affirm that recommendation that comes from the council. As uh, Pastor Randy mentioned, we met on May the 8th, and uh, the council met and discussed with Jared over the course of a couple of hours. Uh, met with him, made sure that he uh, has a relationship with Christ, which is evident, and make sure that he also has a call in his life, and that is also evident. So it is the uh, motion of the council that we recommend and ordain Jared. Okay, all right, so we have this motion really that comes from the council on behalf of our church that we, uh, that we proceed with this, and uh, I think we did it the right way. We met a month ago. When they did mine, they did it all on the same day, you know, and I always thought, well, what if they find something wrong with me and they don't want to go ahead with this, you know? Wouldn't that be embarrassing? I actually heard of a case where that happened one time. Council was, was questioning a man about his, his doctrine, and, and uh, one of the men asked him, do you believe in hell? And the guy said, well, no, I don't believe in hell. Well, how are you going to ordain a man like that? You know? So they had to call it off. Can you imagine how embarrassing that would be to invite people and come and have an ordination service and say, well, we, never mind, we've decided we can't do that in good conscience. And that would be very embarrassing. We certainly didn't anticipate anything like that, but... I think it's best to have the council meet far in advance of any official ordination service, and that's exactly what we did. Okay, so we have a motion that we uh, ordain Brother Jared Arrington as a minister of the gospel and a servant in this church. And if you agree with that motion, so indicate by saying amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Anyone opposed this morning? Praise the Lord. All right. We come to the time where we have the, the laying on of hands, and you now understand exactly what that entails. And so we're going to ask Brother Jerry to come, if he would, and just stand up here at the front and face the congregation and kind of step forward a little bit. And I always ask these guys to get down on both knees because this could take a little while. And so, Jared, if you would, just get down on, on both knees there and face the congregation. And let's have Heather come. Where's Heather at? Is Heather here? There she is. Okay. Had me worried there for a moment, so I thought she skipped out on us. So, Heather, if you come and stand behind him, if you'd like to, you could just place your hands on his shoulder as these men come by. And I'm going to invite uh, all ordained men that are here today. If you've been ordained as a minister or as a deacon, you're invited to participate in this. If you would like to, you don't have to, but you're welcome to do that. And if you guys would go ahead and just make your way up here and just form a line off to my left, to your right, over here. Just come on up and form a line right here up close to Jared. And these men in just a moment are going to file by and place their hands on him and share a word of prayer or affirmation or encouragement to him uh, as we have the laying on of hands. All right, well, let me offer up a prayer as we begin this, all right? Father, we want to thank you for Jared and for Heather and for their boys. And Lord, thank you for bringing them to our church to minister here amongst us and to be with us, Lord. And we just thank you so much for doing that. We just love them so much already. So Lord, now as we have this special time of affirmation as these men come by and lay their hands on Jared, I pray there be a great time of, 
a blessing for him and for Heather and their family as we uh, share with him our hopes and our desires that the Lord would use him in a mighty and tremendous way as he serves you. In your name we pray. Amen.
tradition to, uh, to give a Bible to a, a newly ordained minister. And so we have a, an ESV study Bible we'd like to present to, to Jared. And also uh, his certificate right here that indicates that we had this service today and set him apart and ordained him as a minister of the gospel. So give these guys a hand. Um, I want you guys, if you would, just have a seat here on the front row for a second, just for a second. We're going to have a, a reception uh, over in the fellowship hall, and so we also have a, a fundraiser going on today. It's a potato, baked potato lunch. And so you can kill two birds with one stone this morning. If you'd like to go over and get you a baked potato and enjoy that, you can take it with you if you'd like. Uh, also, we have a cake that we, uh, we bought for Jared and Heather and their family. And so I hope you'll go over and, and have a moment to fellowship with them and, and encourage them and also take a piece of cake. It's a big cake, okay? So we need you to take some cake home with you. Otherwise, uh, Jared and Heather will be eating cake for a long time. So. Uh, anyway, we'd like to invite you to do that. Also, uh, just a few quick things. Uh, our Wednesday night uh, program for kids during the summer begins this Wednesday. Awana has entered, ended since the school year ended, and so on Wednesday nights we have kids stuff. We